Good afternoon to everyone. Today we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Zeifert. And thank you very much that you agreed to give us some interview and to talk to us. Uh, so, and uh, my first question is, uh, what was the heart of your philosophy? The heart of my philosophy? It's a difficult question because I have many different hearts. Maybe uh, in the sphere of knowledge, which I think is in a certain way the most foundational part of philosophy and the condition of everything else, because if you have no knowledge of truth, of reality, then whatever else we say about ethics or God or soul uh, has no foundation. Therefore, I was early already uh, very much interested in this question, reading Plato, reading and getting to know Dietrich von Hildebrand and getting to know his critique of relativism, reading Kant, who seemed to completely subjectivize human knowledge and make it all dependent on subjective forms of intuition, of sense perception, space and time, uh, not ex do not exist, but are only forms under which we see and perceive the appearances and the categories, uh, making everything dependent on the subject and by denying the access to reality, to, mm -hmm. to being as it exists independently of our mm -hmm. subjectivity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote many books and worked a lot about this question first in a book called Knowledge of Objective Truth, in which I very much criticized the Kantian philosophy and tried to expound a realist philosophy. And I use very much the realist phenomenological school and method, which is convinced that we can have some access to real existing beings like myself or the world or God but also to the essences, to the objective natures of things, so that our principles are not just subjective forms under which we interpret the appearances, but rather uh, objectively valid truths which apply to everything like the principle of contradiction, the principle of causality, many others. And so that also in ethics we can understand the essences the intelligible, necessary essences of justice, of mercy, of, of love, of, of forgiveness, of gratitude, and so on. So that also in the sphere of human acts, so their characteristics, their marks, their distinctions from other acts, and so on. So, and of course also the person as such. have written a very big, large book on the defense of the so-called ontological argument for the existence of God, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. St. Anselm of Canterbury developed mm -hmm. in his, mm -hmm. his Postlogion. Mm -hmm. And I've written another book where I explain the five ways of St. Thomas in a new way. I all know that you are um, a student of Hildebrand and you mentioned already uh, his name. So can you tell us a few words about him? What kind of personality he was? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand was born in 1889 and died in 1977. And I had the great uh, privilege of knowing him from childhood on because he had already been a teacher of my mother in Munich, and he was, I think, one of the eminent philosophers of the 20th century, a student of Edmund Husserl and a realist phenomenologist. Mm -hmm. and the phenomenologist, as I understand it, is basically the return to things themselves, uh, go away from, from constructions and from superficial theories or from reductions, like love is only sex uh, and libido, or, or like uh, forgiveness is, is only an attitude of the weak who, who are not able to revenge themselves and so on, like Nietzsche's mm -hmm. Superman. Mm -hmm. So I met him in my early childhood. He was uh, the son of a famous sculptor, Adolf mm -hmm. von Hillebrand, 
who, uh, who made many works in Munich, for example, the Hubertusbrunnen, a beautiful fountain, and made many sculptures and some paintings, and uh, built a beautiful house in Munich and in other houses. And he lived in Florence, he bought a beautiful villa in Florence, where I often was, mm -hmm. to visit Dietrich von Hillewand and his wife mm -hmm. in, in Italy. And so um, Levant grew up in a culturally very rich mm -hmm. world, but his parents and his five sisters mm -hmm. were all without Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And so he grew up, uh, but already with three years, he told his family that their speech about Christ, that he's only a man, a noble man, and nothing more. Mm -hmm. He told them, I swear to you, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay. And so, and he knows, nobody knows how he got his faith for three years because nobody of the family told him and he mm -hmm. had the greatest respect for the family. Maybe that one of the babysitters in Italy mm -hmm. told him about it, but, but he was very, had a deep faith. Mm -hmm. But he did not live, the, he, he, the family was, was was kind of officially Protestant family, but without Protestant uh, faith. His father was more a pantheist, and, mm -hmm. and so a, a kind of art pantheist of nature, and mm -hmm. Spinoza like. <laughs> yeah. And he's, uh, um, but so then he, he underwent a profound perversion, partly inspired by his philosophy, because Max Scheler, the great German mm -hmm. philosopher whom we met, who uh, analyzed with the students the phenomenon of holiness mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. saints, mm -hmm. especially of St. Francis of Assisi and so on. Mm -hmm. He read with them their lives and their, their thoughts, mm -hmm. and he tried to explain to them that this is a higher and more perfect form of morality mm -hmm. than, than natural ethics. Mm -hmm. And so, so these experiences, uh, Hillebrand came to the point where he converted very deeply and became a Catholic, a very fervent one, mm -hmm. and so wrote also quite a few religious books. And these books also influenced me, like The Transformation in Christ, for example, is a beautiful book on the virtues of mm -hmm. the Christians, a sort of an interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I had a kind of crisis of my faith in my, between 12 and 14 or 15 years, meeting Hillebrand and having her hear him lecture and discuss with young people brought me to a deeper faith. Personally, he was uh, extremely kind and warm and, and he had a great love for me, he called me his spiritual son. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said that to everybody, and when we were together for vacation in Italy, he told waiters and so on, this is my spiritual son, mi figlio, mio figlio spirituale. And then he laughed very much because he thought that the waiter never knew what that is, and thought I was an illegitimate son. After the Second Vatican mm -hmm. Council, he wrote this book, The Trojan Horse in the City of God, and and so he was a great, uh, let's say, a great fighter against errors of all mm -hmm. kinds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, can you tell us which book are you working on now? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I just finished some books. Mm -hmm. One is the uh, Philosophia Christiana e Purissima Razón that just came out in Spanish, and mm -hmm. next week I will have a presentation in Madrid of this okay, book. And, um, and then another book, I wrote a little book about the Alma Deutsche, a genius of music, a composer, mm -hmm. uh, and I attribute to her some fundamental philosophical insights. Mm -hmm. When she wrote an opera that when she was only 10 years old, now she is 15. And I am a great admirer of Alma Deutsch's music and her philosophy, because he defends wherever she goes that she wants to compose as beautifully as she can and that she rejects any pressure from society and from others who tell her that today the world is so ugly and complicated, one needs to write ugly and complicated music and not... Mm -hmm not simply such beautiful music. And she says, no, the beauty. As, the more ugly the world is, the more important it is to have some beauty yes. in the ugly world. Mm -hmm. So she, I admire that and many other parts of her philosophy. So I finished that book. But presently, I'm working on a 
on, maybe on two books, but the one that I almost finished is uh, called The uh, Divine Creation of Man and of the World from Nothing, uh, Philosophical Demonstrations or Proofs. And so, I, in the f first four parts, I try to show that the whole world once was nothing. Mm -hmm. And I, I base myself on, on many intuitions of, of medieval philosophers, partly Muslim philosophers and partly Christian, like Saint Bonaventure, mm -hmm. who gave many arguments why it is absolutely impossible that the world existed eternally. Because any being that is in time, that has a year after the other, a million years after the other, mm -hmm. can only last, uh, can, in the pa can never actually reach infinite duration. Mm -hmm. In the future it can be eternally living, but mm -hmm. it never will have lasted eternally. Mm -hmm. And in the past it would have to if it were beginningless, it would have to have existed eternally. And uh, St. Bonaventure, I think, shows, and I try to uh, phenomenologically mm, mm, deepen that, that the kind of being that is in time, uh, however much time you can add into the past or the future, never can last actually infinitely long. Mm -hmm. And therefore, every being, the whole world and man, must have a beginning in time, and they, have, and, and they come from nothing. Mm -hmm. And if they come from nothing, which also some atheists claim, like yeah. uh, Dawkins mm -hmm. says also that the world came from nothing because it cannot have lasted eternally. But then he thinks that it can spring like by a chance and without any cause. And so he attacks the most fundamental philosophical mm -hmm. principles that from nothing, nothing comes, mm -hmm. and nothing can come through nothing. And so I try to show that only an infinite and infinitely good God could create anything from nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I try to, to prove the, even with human reason, the, the, uh, the uh, creation of the world from nothing. And I think there's a deep harmony there from my title of the Spanish book, mm -hmm. um, Philosophia Christiana y Purissima Razón. I think there's a deep harmony with, between faith and reason, but both are necessary in their own realm. And you cannot build a faith without reason, and you cannot, and it's bad if you have a reason that never reaches the level of faith. So I, so, Therefore, I argue against also fideism, against an interpretation of Christian philosophy that just applying the truths of faith and uh, presupposes the faith and, and cannot know anything with reason. I think, no, I think uh, so an authentic Christian faith, reason becomes more rational mm -hmm. <laughs> and more reasonable. And so I think the stupidity of this of this atheist Dawson who say that uh, the world can come from nothing by chance and uh, I think that is a kind of sin against the Holy Spirit because these first principles that from nothing, nothing comes and it, nothing cannot be the cause of the miracle of the world, and, uh, I think. That. And in this book, in the last part, I also have a critique of Darwin's evolutionism and, and try to and agree very much with, uh, with uh, an English writer Magoritsch, who <laughs> says that, uh, that soon the world, the scientists will discover that the theory of evolution of Darwin was an, a mere joke. And they will feel ashamed that for, <laughs> for so many years they believed. Uh, because I think, especially in its atheistic form, I also have a critique of theistic evolutionism, but in its atheistic form it is absolutely the stupidest theory imaginable as origin of the world, that by chance, without any plan, without any person to a creator, by chance, uh, from, from an explosion of Big Bang, uh, living cells, each living cell is a miracle, it's like a work of art that exceeds the greatest human productions. 
and, and, and then the whole body and the whole human body and the different animals and different plants and all the laws of the whole cosmos. Beauty. To think that that's by chance is idiotic. I think it's really, the, the psalm says, the fool speaks in his heart, mm -hmm. there's no God. I think it is, if you think about the kind of marvel of, of nature and of man, then to think that this can come from nothing by accident uh, is, I think, uh, the, the philosophy of an idiot. <laughs> and therefore, I'm very strong in my critique. Because I think if you have a mild critique of evolution, people will not wake up. <laughs> you have to have a, a very strong critique. Mm -hmm. And so I developed that critique that I've developed in several articles before, but I have now a more expanded uh, chapter on this. And it's, of course, especially an evolutionism that tries to explain the origin of the soul is, is mm -hmm. completely very high, because the soul cannot come from matter, and, and therefore all this evolutionary theory are ultimately quite materialistic theories that neither see the newness of life nor of the soul. Another one I write, another research project that I now have been charged with, so the Gustav Sievert Academy, it's a small uh, university in, in Germany, um, is to, to, to give good reasons for the recognition of the human free will mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that, that uh, I have already directed a research project in Chile for two years on that mm -hmm. topic mm -hmm. but I now want to write a new book and, and develop that mm -hmm. uh, also more. Mm -hmm. Oh God uh, helps <laughs> you in this work and you know, so the last question but also really important um, how do you see the future of the Europe? <laughs> the future of yeah. Europe? <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope there is a future mm -hmm. of Europe, and I think uh, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not a, a really uh, like a, a great speculator on the future. But certainly, there is a profound crisis uh, of, of in, in Europe uh, of its whole roots. Uh, a kind of loss of a center. Uh, my teacher in history of art, Hans Hedelmeier, the great historian of art, had, has written a book, The Loss of Center in Art. And I think the loss of center is also in the whole, you know, sciences and, and philosophy. And, and therefore, I think, uh, I think that the atheism, the nihilism, the relativism are very, very dominant in the world. And so I hope that there will be some turn around of this mm -hmm. wave of destructive mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, but whether that will happen, whether it will be only the, what should be or what is, mm -hmm. will be, mm -hmm. I'm not entitled to say. I have some hope there. I think there are some young people and some outstanding groups that very much uh, work in that direction to, to rejuvenate and to restore Europe and keep it from collapsing. But I think uh, too, too few, and there are many more numerically speaking that work to destroy the spiritual identity and roots of Europe, to which also of course belongs the Christian faith, because uh, Europe, uh, unlike ancient Greece or Rome, uh, cannot be really quite conceived without that fundamental role in the formation of culture, of the churches and buildings and the religious services. And I mean, if you take away all Christianity, if you become soon maybe a Muslim country or a Chinese Buddhist country, uh, then it will be, of course, a complete change in the face of Europe. And so, in part, the future of Europe, I think, depends on the future of, of Christianity in Europe. Mm -hmm. and, and also, of course, on whether that will, be, will, be, will enter the law and the politics, or whether it will be only a, a private belief in sort of underground of, of martyrs who will be killed for, for being Christians. And we already are close to that, uh, not only by the millions of murders of abortion of the unborn, 
end of the old, now with euthanasia. I'm just going next week to Spain to, in, to a congress on euthanasia because mm -hmm. the Spanish government announced they want also, like in Belgium and Holland, mm -hmm. to introduce the legality of euthanasia. And so, and that uh, threatens in, in Switzerland, in Austria, and in, in, is in part already in place mm -hmm. and, and in crypto forms, but more and more openly. And so I think, um, I think uh, the question whether, whether in the whole political and legal system these foundations will be destroyed, to which belong not just Christian principles, but natural law, that, that you should not kill. It's not just a Christian principle, that's universal human knowledge. And so therefore, if millions and millions of unborn are killed, that's a kind of complete relapse of Europe into barbarism into a absolutely pagan and, and worse than pagan because in, in, in Rome and Greece there was a sort, there was much, much more respect for life than we have now in our so-called Christian states. Mm -hmm. Therefore I think it's a, it's a huge drama mm -hmm. and who will win in the future of Europe we should pray that the good will win. <laughs> yeah, we should hope. Oh, so thank you for your openness. Thank you for your hearts, <laughs> many hearts of your philosophy. So uh, I think we should uh, finish. And one more time, thank you that you gave an agreement to speak uh, to us and give some interview. Hope to see you again. Um, God bless you and see you next time. <laughs>